Well, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and I guess good evening for some of you, depending on where exactly you're located today. I uh, wanted to welcome you to the um, second quarter uh, Global Genes Corporate Alliance call. Um, as a quick reminder for those of you that may be new to these calls or, or maybe don't have a chance to attend all of them, uh, we do hold a quarterly call, uh, the first, second, and fourth quarters of the year. And then, of course, in the third quarter, we'll have a face-to-face -face meeting that we'll talk a little bit more about later on during the call. Um, but thank you for taking time to join us. Um, as members of the Corporate Alliance, um, you know, this is your call and your venue, and uh, we would like to kind of tailor our content and our discussions uh, to topics that are relevant to you, that, that, that make good use of your time and that are aligned with your own, um, own priorities. So to that end, um, we have our fantastic technology here, uh, Zoom that we're using today. And I would encourage um, everyone who's out there, uh, whether you're sitting at your desk or, or not, to um, feel free to use the technology to ask some questions or to provide some feedback or comments um, as we move along. Um, we'll have the ability to kind of um, address questions as they come in, and we'd very much love to hear your input and feedback as we move along. So um, with that, thank you for joining, and we will move right onward to our, our mission overview with Seth. And Christian, do you want to move to the next slide? Yes. Perfect. So hello, everyone. My name is Seth Fritz, and I work on the corporate engagement team. Our mission is to connect, empower, and inspire the rare disease community. We envision a globally connected community equipped to eliminate the challenges of rare diseases and are guided by our values to be intentional, provide connection, inspire hope, and have a deep impact on patients, caregivers, and all allied stakeholders in the, land, in the rare disease landscape. Thank you. We'd like to take this time to welcome our new members to the Corporate Alliance. We look forward to meeting you all in person. Um, we'd like to welcome Ibsen, Argenix, Cogstate, Neuro, Neurocrine, and Neurogene. Hi, this is Meredith Cagle. I'm the Senior Director of Patient Educate, uh, Engagement here at Global Genes. And I want to set the stage and tell you a little bit about um, some of our expanding global efforts. I think over the next several months, we'll be speaking more about them. But one of the things that we did start last year and has uh, sort of taken off in a partnership with India um, was our uh, first rare global advocacy leadership symposium that we held in conjunction with our patient advocacy summit in October 2018. We had two representatives attend that meeting from the Organization for Rare Diseases uh, India and the already U.S. Um, uh, organization as well. Based on their participation in our event and recognizing that our organizations were working towards a common goal with similar goals and objectives, they reached out to Global Genes and invited us to co-host um, another Global Advocacy Leadership Symposium meeting in India. And, um, and we were able to do that in April 2019. Um, we ended up having 30 in-person participants um, representing more than 35 disease communities at that meeting. You'll see some of the disease communities that were represented, and there were also some umbrella organizations or groups that were working um, with uh, alliances of patient groups. Um, I'm going to pass this in, in a moment to Harsha to speak more about that meeting in person, but we did take that opportunity to introduce Global Genes to our India delegation um, to, for us to learn more about the efforts of ORDI and about the work going on by each of the attendees. We also reviewed at that time a pre-event community assessment that we completed and participated in small group activities to help refine the challenges and oppor uh, identified opportunities and priorities for working together in the future. As part of, sorry, I'm trying to go to the next slide, seems to have frozen for a second. So while I'm working on that, I'm gonna go ahead and just talk it through what we learned about regional challenges from a pre-event needs assessment um, was, and perhaps not surprisingly, that 
Um, the, part, the respondents indicated that access to medicine and treatments were the most um, important regional or most commonly identified regional challenge. Other top um, identified needs included the need for registry and natural history studies, access to diagnostic options, physician and clinician education, um, and clinical trial availability and access. Um, so those were the regional challenges um, identified in, for India before having this event, before people bringing them together. We also asked them about their organizational needs. And the organizational needs were very similar to many expressed by U.S. patient advocacy groups and others um, around the world. And that is that they needed funding and staffing sustainability. They needed help and education in communicating and collaborating with international organizations, government, insurance, um, and healthcare providers, and help with building scientific advi advisory boards. When the group did come together, however, they had a little bit of, um, uh, after some education and learning and discussions, um, I think they reevaluated some of the priorities for that area. And based on, uh, actually, Harsha uh, Rajasima, I'm going to pass the mic to at this point to talk more about what we learned at the Argyles India in person meeting and how that's um, defining some of the activities that we'll be working in partnership with already moving forward. So, Harsha, I'm going to pass to you. Make sure we can hear you. Sure. sure. Thanks a lot, Meredith. Uh, Thanks, Harsha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, growing into a very exciting partnership. Um, as uh, Meredith mentioned, uh, the Organization for Rare Diseases India uh, is focused on uh, meeting the unmet needs for uh, patients in India as an umbrella organization representing the collective voice of all patients with rare diseases there. The conservative estimate is over 70 million people living with uh, several, uh, you know, uh, presumably 7,000 plus rare diseases. But uh, so far, I think we have over 450 uh, plus rare diseases uh, specifically reported. Um, so in this particular meeting, um, there, uh, for the first time, it was exciting to get global genes uh, to India and have all these uh, patient advocates from 35 different organizations come together um, and spend a full day of workshop. And the uh, survey results that came from the global genes uh, unmet needs survey uh, were very uh, handy in uh, getting the focus of uh, these uh, patient groups unmet needs. So what we learned is that, you know, certainly that the research happens in silos. Uh, and first of all, very little research happens in, uh, on rare diseases in India. Um, as we know, much of the funding for rare diseases research uh, comes in the US and, and some in Europe, but very little in India. And very little patient engagement happens in research, uh, if at all. Second is that the understanding of patients as partners in drug development is, is really uh, something that we have been driving and that, that new understanding is developing among the community now, uh, especially in the light of uh, patient-focused drug development that uh, FDA is encouraging and uh, inviting patients to their listening sessions. Um, so we are looking to bring a group of patient advocacy leaders from India to uh, the Global Gene Summit this year, as well as uh, take them to FDA for a listening session, uh, if that works out. Um, they also have a very strong desire to coordinate um, among themselves regionally and nationally in India, uh, but also become activists and engage with their counterparts uh, in the US. Um, so, uh, from a um, reprioritization of regional challenges, uh, you know, awareness, education, policy have been um, something. It, it's a common need for all patient advocacy groups, but they have been um, doing it um, individually as much uh, un until um, our organization for rare diseases India has come together now. But we are still in the process of getting all the organizations to work cohesively and collaboratively to make that national scale. As uh, some of you may be aware, 
the race for seven event uh, which uh, happened in 11 cities in india it's a seven kilometer walk run event uh, for national awareness um, across india so uh, mandatory newborn screening was another area where there was consensus uh, every uh, disease group um, felt strongly that uh, newborn screening should be adopted uh, as of now it's not mandatory in india uh, unlike United States, where we screen for uh, about 60 uh, diseases or so, uh, depending on the state. Uh, but we do not have any disease that's mandatorily screened in India. Uh, and we want to make, uh, we have been advocating for that. Access to low cost uh, genomic testing. Uh, it, it, the testing itself is available, but it's not as low cost yet uh, for uh, most Indians to afford. Development of a national patient registry is, is uh, something that's not um, happening as much uh, yet uh, for uh, most diseases. Um, so the um, uh, recognition uh, of the value of having a good quality patient registry was uh, not um, existing. And so I think that's one area where Global Genes and uh, 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 or the USA were able to uh, help uh, bring that uh, reprioritization as well as access to clinical trials you know uh, that's one area where i think uh, significant improvement can be brought um, is uh, majority of the trials um, happen in the us and europe and there's uh, out of 300000 or so trials registered in clinicaltrials.gov uh, only about 4000 to 5000 trials and and this is for all diseases uh, collectively um, so it, it's a very small percentage, less than three to five percent of trials happen in uh, India. But there is significant interest in being, gaining access and ability to participate in these trials um, for patients in India to get discovered and recruited in uh, clinical trials and expanded access programs. Next slide. Hi, I'm working on it. Sorry, <laughs> I just froze up for a second here. We can get you onto it. There you go. Sorry about that. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as, as next steps, uh, we uh, formed uh, around six uh, working committees of all the patient advocacy uh, leaders that converged at, at this meeting on uh, focused on policy advocacy, national awareness, care coordination, research, and clinical trials and expanded access. So it's really nice uh, that the uh, national leaders are coming together and working uh, um, to build a roadmap for India on what the patient unmet needs are uh, now that we actually have a, a formal survey conducted. Uh, and uh, coincidentally, at the same time, there is a, a scientific publication um, which was also based on patient interviews of 25 different groups um, some of them overlapping with this group uh, has been published. Uh, I'm happy, happy to share a PDF of that uh, article uh, for those who are interested. So as a next step, we also want to bring a delegation of these leaders from India to the Rare Patient Advocacy Summit in September um, and um, uh, also get them, uh, take them to the FDA here in Washington DC area where I am based out of um, to a uh, listening session. And, and this is something we have just reached out to the FDA to seek. Uh, uh, th they did mention that they uh, wish to listen to patient needs and perspectives from around the world. And it's not restricted to US uh, patients alone. So I think it will be great uh, if, if the delegation could uh, go there as well. Uh, but I think they will gain significantly from attending the three day uh, advocacy yeah. summit here in um, uh, California uh, with the global genes and um, have a lot of educational um, talks and seminars and uh, workshops there. Um, as well as, uh, you know, uh, we are collaborating with global genes and very thankful uh, for this collaboration. Uh, we'll be publishing a white paper based on what we learned from the survey as well as the full day workshop at, uh, uh, from an Indian uh, patient advocacy uh, point of view. Other possible next steps, uh, I have uh, participated uh, in the data DIY series um, and uh, there is a uh, next one in July also uh, we are planning to participate. 
uh, and uh, also a pilot project that uh, Nicole will probably speak to uh, on the Rarex project, uh, where we are looking to in, uh, insert a uh, India pilot. Um, and, and we just uh, heard from a uh, government uh, lab in India that's uh, very interested in uh, being a collaborator on that project. Nicole, awesome. uh, <clears throat> yeah, can you can you hear me? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry, we're having tech challenges today. Um, so thank you, Harsha and Meredith. So just, um, you know, so for everyone on the call, first I just wanted to say, um, you know, as we evolve and continue to evolve the Corporate Alliance, I think one of the important things is for us to bring you information and insights and, and uh, things that we're doing that go beyond, you know, kind of an initial program you know, we're reporting to the group about programs. Um, you know, we wanted to share with you, and which is why it was so important to have Harsha on the call to really talk through, you know, what the what the broader goals. And, and Harsha, before I jump into Rarex, I just want you to to talk about, you know, why you know why this is important, and why is this bridge between India and um, the U.S going to be one that can be so fruitful. We talk a lot about the percentage of the global population that's Indian and, um, you know, obviously uh, the growing needs or the, the incredible need and growing opportunities to really help, um, help each other, you know, why you're based here and why you're collaborating. You, like Ordi USA is building a bridge between here and India. I think it's important to hear that. First, so please, if you could just share some some a little more insight, because I think that's really important for everyone on the call. India is kind of um, unknown territory today, and what um, is so compelling to us at Global Genes is uh, while we were there was the incredible, um, the willingness, um, the to um, to partner, the understanding by everyone that participated, and the the, the desire to be. Um, equipped and readied as a community to be participants, to be seen, you know, so that not only they can be supported, but that they can raise their hand and say, you know what, it's valuable for us as, as, a, as a community to be organized well, so we can be global participants um, in research, research develop, drug development, et cetera. So it, it, this is just, it, the, the time is right, and um, Global Genes is so honored and grateful to be collaborating with someone like Harsha and his colleagues um, in India. So if you could just share a little bit more about your strategy and then I'll jump into Rarex and then we can move on. Certainly, Nicole. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, having been in the Washington DC area uh, for the last uh, 20 years uh, or so, um, I've seen that uh, the whole rare disease community in the U.S. Um, has uh, significantly evolved, and I uh, agree with you that the timing is right uh, with the new trend that's uh, happening around patient-focused drug development and patient uh, advocates as the leaders or who are as the drivers of uh, drug discovery and development for rare diseases, particularly small population studies, um, and we need to, there is a definite need to go beyond United States uh, if we have to uh, make significant progress on uh, discovering new therapies or developing them uh, in terms of patient recruitment, uh, understanding the patient, uh, diverse patient needs and um, their unmet needs um, and priorities. Uh, so I think from that point of view and where we are, um, I, I think India and US combined population would be almost a quarter of the global population. Um, you know, India alone is 18% of the world's population. So I think connecting multiple countries is a huge challenge, of course, from a regulatory standpoint, but if we can build a, uh, a, a solid bridge between US and India in the uh, coming years and enable uh, exchange of uh, best practices, uh, exchange of patients from a recruitment standpoint uh, and exchange of knowledge and um, the uh, idea of patient registries and natural history databases, which are so critical, particularly in the context of rare diseases, that um, that has not been happening in India as much. Uh, I, I think the patient groups have the same motivation, passion, and uh, urge to uh, and the altruistic nature. But um, from a point of view of focusing that energy and passion into a productive 
pathway leading towards therapy development, which is where I think Global Genes uh, uh, history over the last 10 years of how we can start with pretty much a single patient uh, with a known condition going all the way to building a group, organizing that into a registry and, and um, natural history database with, with clinical researchers leading and guiding that exercise and, and getting ready for biotech investment to drive towards therapy. I, I think that entire workflow can be fast forwarded and accelerated if we had a much larger patient population from India engaged in this global uh, exercise, which, which uh, largely hasn't happened so far. So I, I think it's a awesome. very powerful uh, collaboration we can looking forward to. Yeah, thank you so so much. And um, you know, from uh, you know both uh, the the original um, Argals meeting last year, many of you were aware of it. Um, from our summit, we will be um, building on a a white paper um, with those that participated in the India meeting with um, Steve Groff, who joined us and helped co-chair. Um, the Argyles meeting uh, in last October, um, and we will be coming out with information and insights about this that kind of talks about the, the global needs, especially in the developing regions. Um, and I know that Meredith will be sharing more over the next several months about some of the other um, international efforts that we'll be um, working on, um, you know, who we're bringing on to help drive some of this. Um, it's, it's some, there's a lot of exciting and important work to be done. So if you guys could um, go to the next slide, that would be awesome. Um, I, I hope that there's two slides. So, um, so as many of you guys know, we, we've um, been talking about this over the last a uh, year or so, and I think presented um, a couple meetings ago, we are entrenched um, in a collaborative uh, nonprofit effort um, with several um, partners like the Broad Institute at Harvard MIT, um, at, with Sage Bio Networks from a governance perspective. We've been working with several patient advocacy organizations um, and patient advocacy leaders, as well as some um, biotech and pharma partners this was um, something that originated out of our medical and scientific advisory board. If you can go back to that other slide real quick, sorry, thank you. Um, so um, we, uh, in fact, I'm sitting in Broad's offices as we speak, um, um, are developing uh, a, a rare X moonshot um, and that will be providing um, uh, access to genetic and whole genome sequencing for those patients and um, families, the trios that need it. Uh, for rare disease, um, disease communities, um, and we will be providing a best-in-class registry as part of this. But the moonshot and the the big, you know, how is this going to change the world for rare disease is the actual interoperable kind of open data repository that's being built. And the goal, the ultimate goal is how can we ensure that, that all these disparate data sets in rare disease can be read and looked at across and can interoperate in a way, can be, you know, federated in a way that um, research can look across, um, you know, multiple disease registries from one disease community or look across different diseases that there might be hypothesis that there could be, um, you know, interre interrelated, uh, interrelated information um, and opportunities looking across different diseases. So this has been a dream for a long time. Last week, we were in um, at the Broad Institute for five half-day meetings to get deep dives on the technology, and it's here, and it's awesome, and um, we will be working now on um, bringing forth RareX um, as, as a nonprofit organization with co-founding partners. Obviously, Global Genes will be a very important one um, here on the patient engagement side. But if you go to the next slide, what we are committing to is um, rolling out a series of pilots over the next 24 months. And I'd like to share what we're proposing and, and finalizing. So the Broad already has um, built some best-in-class patient registries, um, including ataxia, telangiectasia, prion disease, et cetera. We'll be adding other eight other disease community pilots to this that will include whole genome sequencing where necessary 
and then um, a best in class registry. We will be working with Stanford Cords. Um, they have a thousand patient registries within their Cords registry to do one of two things, either help ensure and be a best case or a use case for that interoperability um, across that, that open data repository, um, and or the, it might make more sense to actually um, port over to the RareX platform. Um, so that's TBD. Um, as part of the RareX um, uh, effort, there's also a Rare Genomes project, which is a, an effort to begin by sequencing 2,000 undiagnosed patients kind of within its own open registry, but to help really look at some um, uh, identifying and helping diagnose some difficult um, cases, you know, that, that's a layer here on the broad back end, which has been pretty extraordinary to see. And then related to the conversation that we were just having, um, we are super excited that as part of this project, we are um, looking to finalize India as a RareX pilot project that would bring um, sequencing and um, this registry platform to India um, for Ordi um, and its, uh, you know, kind of the initial 30 partners um, to jump Ordi to manage um, and project manage this for India at the start, but it would be an India um, rare X pilot. Um, all of the diseases that would be participating will be able to be tagged by disease and and um, and um, be able to customize certain elements of um, the registries for um, you know what's related and. Um, you know, important for their particular disease, but um, we are looking to roll this out um, with Harsha and uh, or already the Organization for Rare Disease India and Organization for Rare Disease India USA that Harsha runs um, here uh, in the next 24 months. So we will be working on the details of that. So uh, for those of you that are are um, in the know about Rare X. Um, or for those that aren't and have questions, please feel free to contact us. We'll do deep dives as we move forward and share the organizations that we'll be identifying um, that will be participating early on. If you want to talk to me about um, some disease communities that you think might need one um, that would have the ability to actually um, uh, be a participant, um, you can also reach out to me. But we're very, very, very excited about this and what it, how it will absolutely transform um, you know, our, the world of rare disease as we know it. And we're so grateful um, for those that have already raised their hand to commit to helping um, get involved from a um, corporate um, uh, coalition perspective. And for those that would like to learn more about how to get involved, please don't hesitate to contact me as well. But more to come. Thank you so much, Harsha. Um, as always, we're honored to be partnering with you. You bring so much depth of knowledge about what's happening um, there, and we're honored to be participating with you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, I'm Nicole meeting. and Meredith, for <laughs> having me. Uh, uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, great initiative. Thank you. Okay, Nicole, want to speak a little bit about ACT? Yep, sorry, I spaced. Okay, so um, as many of you know, we are um, continuing forward with what we learned last year at the Access to Critical Therapy Summit. Many of you participated on the outcomes call that we did with our partner, the Child Neurology Foundation, that shared what the small work group um, moved forward with. Um, it's kind of making meaning of all the raw data and everything, um, all of the effort, um, all of the table deep dives, um, the research, everything that came out of that um, last year's meeting, the small work group um, made meaning of it and brought forward the recommendations that we shared um, on the call in April that many of you participated in. Following that call, we actually posted a poll that asked, did we accurately capture the spirit and what, what the proposed outcomes were from that meeting in April. Everyone came back um, that messaged us and said yes. 
Um, so in, in, then in May, what we did was we reviewed between Global Genes and Child Neurology Foundation the outcomes, the feedback from the polling results, and made a decision as to what outputs um, our two organizations were going to help drive. We then reached out and asked those that wanted to participate, either with Time, Talent, or Treasure, um, on moving um, what's next forward to, um, to uh, reach out to Amy or I, and many of you have done so already. Um, if you have not, please feel free to do so. We are going to be start um, gathering the troops um, around the three areas that we will be um, um, working on as an output to the ACT Summit. So the first um, will be the landscape. This is not a landscape assessment um, per se of, um, you know, deep diving on, on the, the different types of frameworks um, and kind of evaluating what's out there. The landscape was really to inform how we're going to do the next two things that you see below. So the landscape is really looking at, you know, we know that since last year, there are a lot of different efforts taking place. You know that the ARM Foundation has built a framework. You know, Faster Cures is building a framework. ICER is reevaluating their value framework. What we aren't seeing so much um, are, um, our kind of guidelines um, um, and and the real integration of the patient provider perspective, you know, uh, throughout a lot of these discussions. So the landscape is really going to just provide a starting point for us um, to know where we need to try to um, help influence and influence with the next two outputs. So the next output. Um, that, so Global Genes will be with, and we're identifying a firm, and we've talked to a couple. One of them, I think, um, is Evidara, that many of you um, have already worked with, and some others. But um, we'll be working um, with a firm to help us with the first two outputs, including the work groups that many of you have raised your hand for. Um, so the so the guidelines, um, you know, this is is an important um, kind of piece of this outreach, including the narratives. Um, but the guidelines are really, you know, how can we ensure that we're providing um, a best practices about engaging the patient perspective as these um, uh, uh, frame, value frameworks are built, um, as discussions are happening around pricing, as biotech and pharma partners are looking to build using the frameworks um, to build out their pricing models. We want to make sure that we can help provide um, what it means and what it looks like and how, what's the best way to ensure that the, the, the patient and provider perspective is included in, in, in and considered, um, you know, as, as those, um, the pricing uh, outputs are, are created. Um, those will also be fueled by narratives that include insights between and, and um, engagement between all the various stakeholders you know, patient to provider, provider to payer, patient to payer, you know, patient to industry, um, and really help bring those guidelines to life. Um, Amy and the Child Neurology Foundation will be building on the narratives and be, be leading that effort um, that we'll be participating as well, and many of you who've, who've um, offered to um, participate there with your time, talent, or treasure, we will be doing the same thing um, we will be leading the landscape and the guideline development um, with those that have volunteered as well as um, a firm that's going to help us bring forward um, some, um, you know, this important work. So for those that haven't raised their hand and stepped forward or interested in participating, please, please feel free to contact um, Nicole B at globalgenes.org or Amy um, Miller, uh, Amy Brin um, at Child Neurology Foundation. Um, so that we can ensure that um, your voice is included. We certainly know that this is a really important effort and the timing is now as well. And we wanna ensure that we have everyone that wants to be involved um, involved um, to help really drive these important outputs. Um, I think that's it for me. Act next steps, I just kind of worked through this. So here's the timeline. Um, I just explained what we were working on. In June, we'll gather together and convene the work groups and start developing the scopes and the timelines and what exactly those outputs will be. 
likely with um, the firm that, that we will be hiring. July and August, we will be continuing to convene um, and work to progress um, the outputs. And the goal is to really have um, the output, you know, the landscape and all of these things that we just discussed to be ready to at least be viewed um, in a beta version, but hopefully they'll be um, very well uh, structured by then um, at the summit meeting in September. So we'll have to work pretty quickly here, but um, this is important and with the right talent and health, we are certain to be able to do it. Now I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Sure. Okay, thanks. Hi everybody, this is Molly McLaughlin. I'm the event manager here at Global Genes. So I was going to talk a little bit about our workshop number two for data DIY, data trust, governance, and collection platforms. So if you have the opportunity to come to the first one in Irvine, we had a really great turnout and I think that everyone really enjoyed the information and networking with each other. So hopefully you can come out to Washington DC for the second workshop. It's July 17th through the 19th. And this workshop is actually a day and a half. And most importantly, this is gonna be a must attend event for key foundation leaders, including board members and scientific, scientific advisors. So this workshop's gonna focus on receiving hands-on mentorship to understand our responsibilities as data stewards and the processes used to protect patients' rights also to develop a plan of governance that prescribes how participants will be recruited, how data will be assessed, and who makes the decisions on sharing data and what will be done to keep the data secured. And finally, assess and compare platform options from equitable partner, partnership agreements. Um, so this one is a little bit different than our previous one. It is a day and a half. Like I mentioned, day two is um, a great hands-on workshop and um, in Washington, D.C. There are gonna be opportunities to watch this on the live stream if you can't make it to Washington, D.C. Um, so um, if you can't make it, then you'll be able to watch on the live stream and that registration will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Hey, um, this is Nicole. I just wanna add one quick thing because it's so incredible. So <clears throat> many of you know Sage Bio Network, the leaders in building governance and science and data <clears throat> governance, excuse me. Um, so they have offered up as experts to host um, half hour to hour sessions with some of um, so with um, the attendees if they so choose. And um, Sage will be uh, bringing forward a lot of their experts to do these one-on-ones, which is extraordinary, I'm sure, as all of you um, could imagine. So. Just a, a shout out and a thank you to our partnership with Sage. This is huge. It will mean be so meaningful for the patients, and we're super honored to be partnering with them. So, just wanted to add that. Thanks, Nicole. And next, so we have. I'm sure that everyone's heard the Rare Patient Advocacy Summit that's going to be down in San Diego, September 18th through 20th. So just wanted to remind everybody that um, if you register be before July 31st, you will get a discounted registration rate. Um, so don't forget to register. And then also a reminder to book your hotel room. We only have a limited number of hotel rooms at a discounted rate. And once that um, block is full, it's a little bit more challenging for us to get additional rooms. So even if you are not sure if you're going to be attending, I would recommend to book your room just so to ensure that you have a place to stay while you're there at the summit. And then lastly, in regards to the summit, if you are interested in exhibiting, you can reach out to events at globalgenes.org. We have our PRA Health Science Exhibit Pavilion with over 70 exhibiting opportunities. We have networking happening in the Exhibit Pavilion and it'll be a really great space to network and share what you guys are doing and talk to patients and also other foundations that are gonna be exhibiting as well. Um, so if you do have any questions, you can reach out to the events at globalgenes.org. 
And then also, um, we're super excited to be partnering with Illumina. They have offered to host our in-person corporate alliance meeting that's going to be held at the summit on Wednesday. So the meeting is going to be Wednesday the 18th from 1230 to 430. We're going to have shuttles for everyone taking you from the Sheraton to the Illumina campus starting at 1145. There'll be lunch provided for you, and um, the meeting will be held there at Illumina. Then buses will take you back to the Sheraton to um, make it in time for our welcome reception in the pavilion. So thank you to Illumina for hosting this for us. It's going to be really exciting. Scott, would you like to close the call? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the, uh, Molly, thanks for kind of outlining the next um, Corporate Alliance meeting there in person. Um, I know we have a couple new members to the Corporate Alliance on today's call. For those of you who haven't had a chance to attend the summit before or attend the Corporate Alliance meeting in person, um, it is really a fantastic event. And I did just want to emphasize one more time for, for those that are used to joining us, um, we've often done that on a Saturday morning kind of following the summit. So just an extra reminder that, as you can see here, the Corporate Alliance is actually on Wednesday, the 18th in person. Um, and that, of course, will replace our uh, third quarter call. But uh, for those of you who have your calendar handy, our fourth, uh, our fourth quarter Corporate Alliance call uh, will be held on Tuesday, December 10th, 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern. Um, and we will be looking forward to any kind of feedback or um, comments you have based on this call today that we can incorporate them into the future. So um, I'd like to well, I'd like to thank all of the, the Global Team staff for um, the time and effort organization for today's call. And I'd like to thank all of our Corporate Alliance members for, for joining us today. Again, the goal of this call is to, um, is, to, uh, is to cater to sort of your interests and your needs and your priorities in your organizations. So please don't be shy about sharing your interests and how we can continue to tailor uh, the content of these meetings towards your, your uh, highest priorities and interests. So thanks again for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you all in San Diego in September.